Some of you might know that we have a Telegram channel. If you look up F Riberson, uh, and on the Telegram channel, sometimes I post thoughts, audio messages, uh, discussing various topics that are not really structured enough to make it into YouTube. And it can be, okay, I think we are live. And it can be uh, just some, some some ideas that are, you know, can be interesting and helpful. And sometimes we chat about it. So if you want to look that up, you're welcome to join the free Telegram channel. And it's uh, it's interesting. Something I wanted to share with you was a few thoughts I had yesterday. Um, I was at a at an event with people with whom I'd been at high school and people I knew from a long, long time ago, and I bumped into. I didn't speak to this person, but I bumped into a. Or well, I saw a rather interesting person, who was the the sister of a woman I dated. And I remembered I had a, a, one of the most unpleasant run-ins with anyone uh, I had with her. And so I thought about it and I thought I'd, you know, we could, we could decode some of what happened there because there's some, there are a few lessons. So for the, for the context, um, we were going, so the three of us were going to, to a music festival some years ago. She, so this woman was a musician, singer, had been in a band. The um, the sister wasn't, even though she played some music, and I was, at the time, I was playing music in a band, uh, taking music very seriously. Uh, I've music has always been something very serious to me and something that I that I really pay attention to, and we had a huge run in in the car because we're talking about a band that she liked, and I said that I uh, I was not a fan. I didn't didn't really see the point and really understand them, and that was one of the times that I've been the most violently and viciously attacked. And it's quite interesting because on the moment, I remember just being completely in shock, taking about two days to just do my thing and not say anything to them. I completely shut down. So one of the things that we learn with when, it, when you look at personality traits is one of the traits is being outgoing and demonstrative and the other one is shutting down and being observing. So it's easy, sort of the first one is, is akin is part of being extroverted, not only extroverted, but part of it. The other part is being introverted. So I could feel I was completely shutting down. Basically, I wasn't feeling safe at all. And it made it led me to be significantly more observing around them, largely because I could feel there was a threat. And I was trying to understand what happened. There was a threat. It didn't make sense. She was older, significantly older, seven years older. Uh, the attack was so vicious that it seemed to me it it had the illusion, the appearance of intellectual validity, but something felt off. And after about two days, I was able to work through what had happened. So for the con uh, again, for the context, we're in the car. I said I don't like the band, and she basically says, "Well, who are you? Who are you to judge? What have you done? What have you done? You haven't done that, for, that much for music, so basically, you're not entitled to have an opinion. You you criticize this band, but what have you done?" You know, you you play, but that's not as serious. This band has sold loads of albums. They're very successful. Therefore, they know something you don't, and therefore everything you say or nothing you say makes sense. You're not entitled to have an opinion about this. And that that was, you know, brutal, because it was not attacking my argument. Well, not even it was an argument. I was expressing a preference. Uh, but if there was an argument, it wasn't attacking the argument. It wasn't discussing it. It wasn't thinking. You know, hmm, that's interesting. There's there's something you don't like that other people like. What is it you don't like? You know, which would then lead to a proper, normal, healthy conversation. Being curious. Instead, it was attacking me, claiming I didn't have the qualifications to talk about a specific topic, and therefore I should just be quiet, and I shouldn't be I shouldn't be sharing anything. And I was able in a few days to to understand that it basically was an was an ad hominem attack. I didn't know what ad hominem was, but it was basically the, the ad hominem attack. So you attack the person, not the argument. In other words, you're not a professional musician, so you're not entitled to have an opinion about anything music related, or all your opinions are ridiculous. Uh, there's a point to be made, incidentally, about it's easy to criticize from the outside. Why don't you go and do something? That point is true. And at the same time, you don't need to know how to write an opera to have an opinion about opera. You don't need to be a movie director to have an opinion about movies. You can, uh, you know, recognize 
yes, it's difficult to do a movie, and also, I have opinions about movies, and I'll, you know, the opinion may or may not be valid, but the argument should be the focal point. So, I understood this, I explained it, assuming that the person would say, fair point, I take back what I said. And instead, yeah, exactly, she went for my throat. And instead, you can probably guess what happened. Instead, she she just shrugged it off and sort of went, I don't, I don't see the point, I don't see the problem. Um, you know, you got a problem with it, but whatever. She didn't care. And the, 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 the point that surprised me there was thinking, this was, it was aggressive, was violent, intellectually it makes no sense. I just invalidated what you did. So the, the least I'd expect would be take a step back and, and, and think th about it a little bit more, uh, have a different point of view. And there was nothing of the sort. But of course, what actually really was happening was I was challenging her authority. She had this sort of aura, the status of being, I'm a musician, I know better, I can talk about this, don't come and challenge me because you're not entitled to do this, so you should shut your mouth because I don't want to argue anything, because I can go around proclaiming which bands are interesting and good and which ones, which ones aren't, because it gives, of course, all of the, all of the clout, and you're a nobody. And this is, it's a rather common theme, it sort of is, um, here, let me, I think I can jump in with, with a graph. Graphs can be quite easy for this. This is something that people often use, revert to. It's what I call proxy thinking. It's saying, for instance, because it's difficult to judge the quality of thinking, or the quality of thought, at least for some people it's difficult, Others who have some level of logic and intelligence and so on can take an argument and think, does the argument make sense or not? But not everyone has this. Uh, I just saw someone who, who earlier made a snarky comment in one of my videos where I was using logic and they made a snarky comment about, well, you don't find this, I haven't seen this in the DSM. And no, you haven't, because I'm just using logic, which is normally taught to children around the ages of probably six or seven just how do you put different groups together and how do you put, yeah, different, uh, you know, you put the blue Legos in the blue Lego box and the red Legos in the red Lego box. That's not part of the DSM, that's part of using logic. Anyway, in this case, the proxy argument. You have quality and then you have, uh, so quality is also, valid wait, that looks ridiculous, validity. Quality versus valid, uh, quality or validity versus clout. The idea is that the more clout you have, the more the quality or the validity of the argument should increase. So because it's very difficult to measure the quality or validity, you simply look how much clout does the person have. This would be for a long time on Twitter, this is one of the funny things when Musk changed the rules on Twitter, if someone had a blue tick mark, that meant clout. That meant this person's opinions way more. This was the proxy argument. Their opinions way more. And of course, if they had the blue tick mark and it was removed or other people could get it, they were losing the clout, the status. This is also the case of, for example, university professors who say, because I'm a university professor, I know better. Don't you dare come and challenge me. Because who are you? I'm a professor and you're a nobody. You're a student. When I, so in the past at university, I was always considering, we look at the validity of the argument rather than the person expressing the argument. And I could see them, I, I noticed quite often Professors who had very poor arguments, if they were challenged when it came to the validity, they would switch from validity to attacking the person. And of course, they had a lot of experience attacking the person, using ad hominem attacks, uh, humiliating them, or hallucinating small flaws in order to shift the, the focus away from the quality and validity back simply to the clout. 
In other words, well, when you say that, you're being judgmental. They use this, uh, you know, there, there's a point, a point to be made about avoiding normative arguments. But when they use this, it sounds terrible being judgmental. You know, you're being judgmental. It's like, you know what? Maybe if I'm assessing policies and I'm comparing a policy that led to the death of 2 million people versus the death of 20,000 people, yes, maybe it's judgmental to say that 2 million is more than 20,000, but you know what? I'm okay with that. I'm okay with comparing things, especially when things are numerical. It's different when things are qualitative, but when it's numerical, I'm fine with it. When it comes to um, when it comes to, to to things like music, it's much more subjective, of course, because you can adore a band that nobody else likes. And when you look at some of the most popular bands, it's not because they're popular that objectively the music they do is any better. Sometimes you have a correlation. Pink Floyd was amazingly, still is amazingly popular one of the most fantastic bands that I that I know of and you also have some very small niche bands that are unbelievable and very popular musicians that are atrocious or the musical quality of what they do even they won't say we're trying to reinvent the wheel and do something amazing it's simply we give people something they like and if they like it fine you know fair enough if you like that kind of music okay if you enjoy it fine but we're not falling into the quality you know, the, the validity clout fallacy. So what this woman was doing was seeing that my arguments generally had some quality to them or some validity. People are free to disagree. Generally, I'm able to construct an argument. I'm not saying I'm right, simply the log there is merit to my argument and there's logic and then we can disagree. When people can't disagree, they move away from judging the argument to attacking the person and that's exactly what she did i pointed it out thinking she'd say yeah you know okay fair point forget about it if it wasn't that it had been something else because i was a target because i was not recognizing her supremacy over me in that family so that was the case for the the sister whom i dated it was the case for the, the older sister and the brother and i remember also with the, the brother having the strange fallout, because I said something that I thought was positive about him, that he was very, very charismatic. She relayed that to him as being, I was criticizing him, and he thought I was being, I was, which complete surprised me, because I, I didn't understand what was happening. But they had a very, how would I put it? Um, uh, let's say vertical relationship with things, that the idea is that, Normally you have two humans who just interact together, but sometimes you have one person who positions themselves as playing God. And they know better, and they rule over others. They tell others how to react. There we go, that's nicer. Tell others how to react. And never, ever dare question anything they do. Never. If you do that, you're insolent, you're not submissive, you're, you're challenging them, you're questioning them, and um, and this is this is uh, yeah you're basically challenging the authority and therefore if you challenge the authority instead of just having a normal human to human conversation they will start attacking you as a person because uh, because you're a threat uh, you might have come across this let me have a look quickly at the at the chat uh, and welcome to everyone who is who's joining by the way. Um, there we go. Yeah, isn't that a form of triangulation? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by triangulation. If, you, if you'd like to, to explain that, then I'd be very happy to do that. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly, that's the thing. I will judge you all the time. You've got no right to judge. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, I had an interesting run in with someone recently that is that's similar to this i just got another error message by the way so hopefully things are working out okay and it's not buffering too much um let me let me run you through this 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 run in because it was was quite interesting this is a person who i mentioned her in another video um generally somebody whom i appreciate a lot 
whom I regard a lot and who I'm seeing now has a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde personality. That's pretty interesting. Let's see if I can, if I can, here we go, should be able to explain this. So on the one hand, this is, this person is absolutely wonderful and absolutely lovely, like 90% of the time, at least in my experience, 90% of the time. And I triggered something in her that led to an absolutely horrible conversation encounter. And this happens when people get co-opted with ideologies and dogma. One of the symptoms of this is people who define themselves as a something ist, or they so subscribe to any group of thought that would typically end with an ism. And you can pretty much take any ist, any ism, pretty much, and it works. What I mean by that, I've seen, hey, what's going on? Okay. So you might remember the model that I use that says that to make a decision, we take data, we feed the data into an algorithm. The algorithm then produces a result. And this we compare to reality. Whoops. Reality, which then we then feeds back into the data. And the four kinds of data, data that's false, data that is true and relevant, and data that is true and irrelevant. Now, a healthy person works through this going around following the circle. In other words, let's first of all establish what the facts are. See what facts we see. Keep an open mind and just take the facts. And make sure we're focusing on facts that are true, so we avoid everything that's false and we try to figure out what is relevant. Then we look at the algorithm we use. It's the way we think. In other words, how do I weigh pros and cons of different things? How do I make sense of different things? How do I interpret the data? What is the best way to think without cognitive, without uh, blind spots, without uh, cognitive biases? Based on this, it should lead to some form of result that makes sense. And then we're going to compare this to reality and we see if this adds up or not. And it probably doesn't, which then feeds back and we go around again in circles and circles. And all we care about is, can we match the result with reality? Are we able to model reality? Are we able to make sense of reality? Are we able to navigate better in reality? And if we are, our life is better and the life of people around us improves. And that's the goal is to make things move up. So. If we want things to improve, if we want reality to get better, we need things to match. If they don't match, then what happens is things get worse in reality and things go down. With the ists and the isms, people start with the result. They start with the model of reality. They say reality is this and they work backwards. That's why it's so backwards thinking. They work backwards. They say this is the result that my result is reality. So actually, I shouldn't even do this. I'll do it this way. Do it like this. There we go. My result is reality. In order to prove to you that my result is reality, because that is their, their dogma. It's like, this is the case. I will work backwards and I will create an algorithm that yields this result. I will cherry pick data, which may be true and irrelevant, it might happen to be true and relevant, but I'll even take data that is false if I need to, because my end goal is the result. My end goal is the result. I'll do whatever it takes to get this. And if reality doesn't match, then the problem is reality. My end goal becomes reality. It's a substitute for reality. What happens with this? Things get worse. People can't navigate reality, and they are miserable. And as soon as you point out that something is wrong with the data, or that they have a mistake with the algorithm, that suddenly threatens their reality or their result, and you become a target. And this is exactly what happened. This person wanted to give me an example of her ism, dogma. She even said, like, I am an ist, and 
I didn't register on the moment. I wasn't prepared. I thought it was a conversation. I thought yeah, we can have, you know, conversation, compare things and, you know, see if there's some flexibility. To prove this, she said, look, in my children's school, there's a room where kids are free to do whatever they want. In this room, the boys are creating a problem. They are playing rough and tough, and my daughter doesn't want to go there. Okay. The, I'm guessing when she says this, my assumption is that what she's saying is true. I don't know if it's relevant or not, but let's figure out. Like, my assumption is that it's true. But I ask her, when you say the boys, is it all the boys in equal measure? And she goes, no, 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 it's especially two boys, well, especially one, but one or two boys. Okay, so I ask her, in this case, the other boys, how do they feel about this? Well, some of them complain, they're not too happy. Okay, do all of them go in there? No. Do all of them play along? No. A few of them go along, but they don't really like it. So I tell her, and she, she should know about narcissism and narcissists having married one after what a psychologist told psychologist told her to do. She knows about it. And I, you know, I point out, 10% of any group is toxic. If you've got 10 boys in the classroom, there's a high probability that at least one of them is toxic and you're describing a little bully. You're describing, and she described like the parents. This is a messed up kid who's making everything toxic for everyone else. And maybe he's got a buddy, so then two of them are bullies. But about eight of the other boys are not really happy about this. So you can walk into this with the, it's a boys versus girls thing. That's one filter. Okay, why not? There's some merit to this. And you can also walk into it, and I'm not saying but, I'm saying and, you can also walk into it with the toxicity filter. In other words, if you view it through toxicity filter, one or two of the kids are a problem. If there are 20 children in the classroom, I'm assuming it's about 20, that means 18 of the children are suffering, including 80% of the boys. If this is the case, then the issue isn't a boy versus girls, it's a bullies versus non-bullies, which unites all of us because we don't like bullies. And so in this case, just debating the data, what you know, what is true, what is relevant, the algorithm, how do we process it? And this led into cognitive dissonance. That started with uh, a few of the signs of cognitive dissonance you might know, such as the word salad, such as the projection, the ad hominem attacks. And this led into a pretty unpleasant uh, interaction, which I'd like to detail now. Because as soon as there's word salad and, and the cognitive dissonance, the person goes off rail and you can't reason with them anymore. So it's something you'd assume I should be knowing about this and I missed it. So when people go, I should know better, it's like, listen, it's fine. All of this is complex. On the spur of the moment, it's hard to remember everything. I, I'm even doing these, 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 these you know, I'm not going to swear, doing these YouTube videos, like explaining the models. And when I'm faced with it, I don't always pick up on what's happening. So this is how complex it is. And there are a lot of other parameters and blind spots and so on. So if it happens to you, you know, give yourself a bit of a break. It's not easy to pick up on these things. Okay. What she did was the, the similar thing to the other person, which was you are not in a position to talk about certain topics. So it started with the ad hominem attack. You can't talk about this because you don't know, based on experience. This is the uh, the sort of, uh, how would I call it? It's something along, along the lines of the scars. You don't have the scars to talk about this, the scars or the clout. With the, the other person with the music was clout, in this case it's the scars. You don't have the scars to talk about it. To which I replied, no, really? You, you don't actually know that much about me. I've got many scars that I'm not showing you. And I'm going to run, the, I'm going to run uh, you through how to, how to do this. I've got many scars I'm not showing you. And she goes, go on then, show them. And I say, the thing is, I'm not showing them as a man. Because when men show these scars, they're not believed and they're mocked and they're ridiculed. But she does this thing of going, I, I don't believe you have the scars. Okay, so I show one scar. 
there we go, one scar. And what happens is that one is, first of all, disbelieved. No, you don't. So first thing I said, I will show you I have the scar and you won't believe me. Okay, disbelieved. The next step is, you know, to double down and give more information about the scar. More details, like basically when it's no you don't, disbelieved, in other words, calling me a liar. And when something bad happens to you, you know, I'm not a fan of the, the use of the word victim, but usually when something bad happens, one of the things we try to do is listen to the person and not do all of the victim blaming, victim shaming and all of that, you know, there's pros and cons. But if something happens and you actually do have a scar to show it, how about not saying there is no scar there? Okay, double down, more info, and then it's minimized. And after being minimized, the next step, of course, is it's being mocked. And well, what happens then is you go, well, you know, if I'm sharing something pretty sensitive, pretty unpleasant with you, and you're not believing me, then minimizing me, then mocking me, and then also, of course, uh, comparing saying your scar doesn't matter as much as somebody else's. It's like, well, you, you can do that, but based on what? Seriously. And I thought about this, and this reminded me of a, of a, a Shakespeare play that's also a movie, which is called Coriolanus. I highly recommend watching the movie. It's got Ray Fiennes in it and uh, Jared Butler. It's amazing acting. And Coriolanus, the story is, um, there we go. And the story of Coriolanus is Coriolanus is a Roman general who's fighting for Rome. He's a nobleman. He goes into battles. He's respected by his men. He's feared by his enemies because he's such a ferocious fighter. He's fearless. He's been hurt multiple times and he has multiple scars. Coming back from battle, so he's, I think I mentioned from a noble family, the the demagogues, the, the populists, want him to show his scars. To They sort of challenge him, like, do you really, have you really done that? Show your scars. And he refuses to do this. And because he refuses, they they basically call him a liar. So imagine though you're your your general. You risk your life, you get hurt, you get wounded, severely wounded, and people mock you and don't believe you and call you a liar. In the, the, the Ray Fiennes film, there's a scene where it's so it's filmed in, in the modern day, which is pretty interesting, and he's on some kind of reality TV or on a TV show, and they mock him. And they basically say, well, if you won't do it, we don't believe you, we'll cast you away from Rome. And he does this beautiful speech full of contempt and disgust towards them. It's beautifully acted. And he basically says, you peasants, I am, so he's full of contempt, I am uh, something like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm noble, I'm from a good family, I don't have to do any of this, but I do it anyway. I risk my life for you, I risk everything for you. I despise you and I do it anyway. And this is how you repay me? This is it? No gratitude? No recognition? You want me to humiliate myself and show you my scars? I won't do it. You banish me from Rome. I banish Rome from me. And then he leaves Rome and joins the enemies of Rome and swears to burn Rome down. Obviously, I'm not suggesting to do anything as radical as Caius Martius Coriolanus. However, the attitude, I believe, is the right one, which is, you want to see my scars? That's humiliating. If I tell you I have scars, we don't have to go further. If I show you my scar, what will you do? If you dare, if I show you my scar, if you dare, in this case, disbelieve me, call me a liar when I show it to you, and then minimize it or mock me. If that is the case, what does that say about you? What kind of person would do that? 
But I think really the best thing to do is just to, to take the step back and stop at the beginning. Like I also have scars, you know, and this is not a competition of who's got the most scars. That's not how life works. It's your scars are yours. Everyone has their own cross, their own burden to carry. And your cross is not one I would envy on anyone else. And maybe it's just the right weight for you to carry. But I guarantee you, my cross is not lighter than someone else's. It's different. Everyone has the cross. Everyone has the burden they have to carry. And to to suggest that any human being has got no cross to carry, it's appalling. It's dehumanizing. The cross is larger what makes us human. It's the, the, the challenge, the character. The, we're united in the fact we all have to deal with our issues. But to suggest that one of us doesn't have to because of some, some ludicrous, completely irrelevant characteristic, that's dehumanizing. That's exactly what narcissists do. They dehumanize others. And instead of being united, thinking, I have my cross to carry, you have yours, regardless of who you are, you're a human, and I'm a human, and we're in this together, and how can we help each other out? How can I listen to you and learn from you, and how can you listen to me and learn from me, and how can we support each other? How can we try to get through this together? Try to maybe lesser the burden, or try to make it less difficult, or at least sow a bit of sympathy for the other person and their trials and their difficulties. No, instead, you want to divide us? Instead, you want to minimize, mock me, belittle me? You want to add to my burden? Is that really, really how you see humanity? Is that the way you see things? And some people, they do. Why? Because for them, it's not about humanity. For them, it's about the dogmatism and the algorithm. For them, it's about proving their ideas are right. Why? Well, one reason is because for many people, the algorithm is a substitute to a personality. People identify with their ideas. And if they don't know who they are, it's easy to embrace the ideas and saying, I am a something ist, or I believe some kind of ism. I remember one, one narcissist that I, that I was involved with. I remember being shocked when she was telling me, I'm a hipster. I thought, what do you mean by that? Like, really? I'm trying to understand you as a person. I'm trying to understand your background and your complexity. And, and this person claimed to have had a very difficult childhood and very difficult upbringing. And I wanted to understand. And one of the, the keys she gave me is, I'm a hipster. Okay. That is meant to tell me how you dress and what kind of coffee you drink. And that's it. It says nothing about your personality. But there was nothing behind that. For some people, the mask that they wear is who they are. And that can be really tricky when, on the one hand, you have the real person, who they are, and the mask is feeling threatened and the mask takes over. That's the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde approach. That's exactly what I had with this person. As soon as I questioned her algorithm, as soon as I questioned the result of her thinking, not saying that she was wrong, but simply offering a different point of view, the two points of view, in my sense, are not uh, not in comparison, because what she was saying was also interesting, and it didn't explain everything. Like, there is merit to that thinking. Okay, and what do we do with that? How do we go further? How do we go beyond? It's the boys versus the girls, and it could just be, you know, sometimes people need to learn how to, to interact differently. There's, there's, there's merit to that. But to turn everything into only that, say there's only one point of view, nothing else is, is, is valid. You know, here we go back to uh, we go back to, first of all, the, 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 the sort of validity and clout, so you can't say anything. And then, you know, to say that, it is saying, I'm God, I'm judging, I'm telling you how to think, don't you dare question. And why? And for me, that's a survival mechanism of really bad ideas, of a mind virus that's trying to, trying to survive. And it was unnerving to see this because the whole body switched the face switched, the tone of voice switched. We went from having a conversation to her talking 90% of the time. And the 10% of the time I spoke, she'd interrupt me. And when I point out, you know, I'm, I'm trying to finish my sentences. You interrupt me and hallucinate that I think something I don't think. 
and you cut me off in the middle of my sentence? Then she doubled down with more cognitive dissonance. This is one of the reasons why pick up on cognitive dissonance. And remember also, narcissist behavior is not exclusive to narcissists. The narcissists are always in this type of thing, or it's always underlying. With some people, it's only when you tap into the algorithm. It's one reason why people say, don't talk about politics or religion with others, because if you tap into the algorithm, you risk triggering the cognitive dissonance. But once we understand this, it makes it significantly easier to understand how did things derail? What was the mechanism? Why is it that if we're talking about music, all of a sudden I'm getting attacked as a person? Well, largely that's because I'm challenging your narrative that you've got all the solutions and I'm just a subject I should shut my mouth. Maybe it's because you're using the, uh, the, 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 the clout versus quality and validity shortcut. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's because I'm trying to have a conversation with, you know, one person, but instead I've got the, the, the other, like the other persona that's trying to take over because I'm challenging the way that, uh, that they think. Or I'm challenging the ideas and the ideas are trying to survive inside that head. And if I'm coming along with information, especially if it's true and relevant, and we know that it's true and relevant, then I'm a threat. The arguments are a threat. But then it's so easy for people to think, why should I listen to anything he says? Because after all, I'll place him down here in terms of clout. So if he's down here, the ideas must be stupid. So it's a shortcut to thinking when people either don't know how to think or don't want to think. There we go, that's my, that's my, my rant. That's what I was having in mind. Uh, I've got no idea if any of that is, is speaks to you. I'm going to go back. I couldn't see the chat because of, uh, because of different windows. So let us see how, um, how, let's see if that was speaking to, to anyone. Uh, bum, 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 bum. And, oh yeah, and then I'll share with you, I'll just go through this quickly. Then I'll share with you one way to manage this that, um, that I was thinking of afterwards. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Hi Tiverton, hi Prestonic, INR, hi UNA, absolutely confirmation bias. If you look up cognitive biases, there's a very good book by a guy called Rolf Dubli called How to Think Clearly or The Art of Thinking Clearly, something like that, and he summarizes cognitive biases. He basically just copied a Daniel Kahneman but made it a bit more easy to read. Um, yeah, there we go, there we go. Absolutely brain trumps all. Hey, Peter, good to see you. Okay, so let me run Let me run you through what I think or what can work quite nicely here. So what can work quite nicely when we talk with people like this is something along the lines of saying, so first of all, we have one thing that happens. It's an event. And to the event, we have an interpretation there we go, interpretation, you know, which is a sort of a conclusion, I'm making this up as I go along. There we go, event, interpretation, conclusion. People usually say, you said this, it is because of this other thing. In other words, I'm doing mind reading or I'm doing projection or something like that, okay? First step is we ask, and all of this is, is, is calibrated. First step is we ask um, something like, or we try to make the statement, it seems that you're 100% convinced that this is the case, you know, which probably yields some kind of yes response. You know, number two, you want to say something along the lines of, it seems that you're sure that there is no alternative explanation. There's none. And I'll go, absolutely, there is no, no alternative explanation. There's only one explanation. My explanation is the only acceptable or the only imaginable explanation. There's no, there's no other one. So I can't imagine one, or if I could, it's not, it's not imaginable. Okay. After this, so we say something like, you know, even if there's an alternative, you're sure that alternative is wrong. To which they'll say, I'm sure it's wrong. Okay. 
You don't know what it is, but you're really sure it's wrong. That's fine. And then you could say something along the lines of, you know, you're you're pretty sure that um, how do I put it? Yeah. So there's no an alternative explanation, and you actually want to say something like, you can't think of any. However ridiculous. And here it's going to be difficult for them. They'll probably say, no, I I can't think of any. I can't think of any. Or they might go, well, I can think of some, but they're stupid. It's like, okay, name them. Give us some alternative explanations. Here you're probably already likely to get pushback because you're asking them to do something they don't want to do it. But anyway, it's fine. Then the way we'd attack this is to start here with the alternatives and suggest three alternatives. Because you can probably think of three alternatives, such as you were late in order to spite me. Okay, that's one explanation. Fine. You think I was late in order to annoy you. You can't think of any alternatives. No, because I know you were late in order to spite me. Okay, I can think of three other explanations. Number one, I got stuck in traffic. Okay, that's one explanation. I'm not saying it's valid, and it's possible. Number two, I got sick, and I wasn't feeling well, and that's why I left home a bit later. You know, number three, I left home, realized I've got my phone, so I had to go back home to get my phone. I'm not saying they're valid, it can be very stupid, but those are, nonetheless, three alternative explanations. Then we say, you know, of the four explanations, you know, they're one, and, uh, and the ones we did, we have A, B, C, D. They say that theirs is 100% and all the other ones are 0%. To which they'll probably say, yes, absolutely. The, the main point here is you find explanations that have some validity. And part of it could be traffic, part of it could be a train that's cancelled or a train that's a bit late. Uh, it could be that you pop by to pick up flowers or whatever it might be. And then it's saying, you know, you're certain this is the case. But let's imagine that it's a combination of different things. You know, either you think it's I'm really trying to spite you or it's something else. Of course, if the person's conclusion is you're trying to spite me, then generally it's a good idea to reconsider what you're doing in that relationship because that's a very different conversation. But here what we're trying to do is we're trying to focus on their inability to come up with alternatives because then it's the one-upmanship thing. It's saying, you know, of course I'm better than you. I'm not less than you. So I can do anything you can do. It's like, yeah, you say that, but you can't come up with alternative explanations. Oh, good grief. Sorry, I've been drawing all of this and completely missed it, looking at the wrong uh, the, 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 the wrong part of the screen. So there we go. The event, the, the interpretation, conclusion, uh, 100%, sure no alternatives, can't think of any, even if the alternatives, you know, you're sure it's wrong. So it's the inability to think of alternatives. And then it's challenging... If they say, it, I know it's 0%, you know, number C, such as I, I got a call before I had to leave, it's like, okay. So if I showed you that I had a call just before I was about to leave, then what, what would you do? You can, you know, you can show it on the phone. Obviously, we want to avoid getting sucked into debates with these people. Sometimes we can't avoid it when it comes to maybe family members or colleagues. So... This can be one way to shut down the debate of you're doing this because of X and then you, you don't get into it. You examine the way they're thinking and doing the thing of, you know, you're, it seems that you're certain that there's only one explanation and you're certain there's no alternative. Usually when you get around this point, you probably lose them. But if they, if they end up doing a hissy fit and going away, at least you got them out of your way and you don't need to worry too much about them. Uh, rather than getting sucked into the trying to justify yourself, because that can be just absolutely, absolutely exhausting. Um, so that's part of the technique I want to share with you. I hope that you found that helpful. I'll switch back to the other window and have a look at the comments quickly. Uh, and any questions? Here we go. Um, yeah, okay. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah, exactly, Tiverton. As you say, make up a lie. Go backwards, how they come to the conclusion through lies, delusions, and it's often a combination of a bit of truth. You know, that's the best way to make people believe lies is to mix up lies and truth. 
But that's the that's the the image I like there saying I'm baking an apple pie and I throw a bit of broken glass into the apple pie. And anytime you go, there's a bit of glass in here, I go, yeah, but there's apple. You know, there's apple. You're saying there's no apple in my pie. It's ridiculous. The question isn't, is there any apple in the pie? The question is, is there any glass and do you care about it? The question is, when you talk to me, are there any lies and is that a problem for you? If you lie to me and it's not a problem for you, then that's a problem. If you lie to me, that's a problem. If if lies are okay to you, that simply is because you are trying to reach a result and your your you, you or rather you start with the result and you you retrofit you ret yeah you retrofit the data and the algorithm to get you to the result that's the akin to the person who says everything in society can be explained by looking at men and women as different groups everything absolutely everything that's the only filter we need and it explains everything it's a helpful filter don't get me wrong and it doesn't explain everything. And to claim it does is misleading uh, and demonstrates demonstrates ideological possession. Uh, and look at the results. The people who claim that, how happy are they? That's not great. How many narcissists do they have in their life? You know, pretty big number. Um, how, how, how do they get along with positive, happy, healthy people? Not great. So if it doesn't help us navigate reality, if it doesn't help us bring ourselves and our loved ones and people up, if it doesn't help us make things better, then, then, um, then maybe consider that it's also interesting to have a second point of view. And then just compare the two and just think that, that things, can be, things can be interesting. Um, if we have more than one point of view and maybe a bit of both is interesting or figuring out which one helps most you know use both I'm not saying never use it just don't don't only use that all the time it's like with any filter don't only use one filter all the time because it's it's not I mean, if you use the narcissism filter on everyone all the time then you end up concluding that everyone's a narcissist uh so you know hence i, I prefer saying we all have some level of toxicity so if we can pick up on that, fine. And let's see who tries to minimize toxicity and who's okay with it and who thinks people deserve it and who's happy maximizing the toxicity. Um, yeah, Mindy, like you say, if they uh, if they let you speak, it might work. Uh, but then sometimes just shut down and observe them. You know, it's fine. Th this also, largely what I'm sharing, by the way, is not about having conversations with them. It's having the conversation inside our head to go, Okay, now I see what's going on. This person is being ideologically possessed. They're suffering from cognitive dissonance, so there's no point talking to them because they can't hear me, because everything I'm going to say will be interpreted in a way for them to disqualify me because the really dodgy ideological dogmatic ideas are trying to survive and I'm too much of a threat, so I don't need to open my mouth because these people are not... There we go. These people are not judges. These people are simply being manipulated by an idea. Maybe an image that comes to mind here is rather than having these guys like this, is you have the idea that is trying to express themselves through the person. Okay, it looks a bit like a cat, but it's trying to express themselves through the person. So in this case, you're not talking to the real person. You actually, well, you're trying to talk to the real person, but you're getting the ideology talk through you through them ideologies are not good they're they're not helpful they're they don't care about truth i'm not talking about faith talking about really about ideology um faith and stuff like that it's a it's a little bit a little bit of a different beast but yeah that's uh, that's part of the thing that we that we uh, that we get um oh hi urasa good to see you and a real deal thank you thank you very much Okay, I think I think that's pretty much all I had for today. Um, yeah, I'm running out of time also. I gotta go. Thank you so much everyone for joining in. Thank you. It's been great to see you. Uh, I've been really busy so not much time to to edit two videos and post as you can see I've got a uh, I don't have my my regular setup with me today. 
uh, but hopefully there wasn't too much of a distraction. Thank you everyone for joining. Everyone, please do take care. Stay positive, smiley, happy. Uh, spring is here. Life is good. Things get better. Uh, we're all going. We're going uphill. We're helping each other out. We. Everyone has got their cross, and we can share tips to make it easier, less difficult for each other. And um, and it's a bit like the, the myth of Sisyphus. At one point, you know, we're rolling the, the the rock up the hill, but everyone is rolling their own rock up their own hill. But we can talk to each other, and and that's not bad. That's not bad at all. So thank you for joining. Everyone, take care, and I will see you soon. Bye.